thank you. So, can you hear me? Does that work? Okay. Well, uh, thank you, Sandy, for and, and I thank you all for having me uh, speak. I, I really appreciate it. Um, uh, as she said, I, I'm a otolaryngologist with Arkansas Otolaryngology Center, um, and so we are one of the larger groups uh, in the state and and in the country. Um, this is a picture of our, our uh, main office. We have um, the main office that I work on is at the uh, Canis facility, uh, but this is our North Little Rock office, a Benton office, and then Mid-City office in the uh, doctor's building. We, ha we have four Central Arkansas locations and seven satellite offices, so um, uh, we have a lot of people. And so Sandy asked me to talk about uh, uh, something to, uh, about ear, nose, and throat. And, you know, e ENT is really a broad topic. Uh, and so I feel fortunate because, you know, we, we do just the ear, nose, and throat and not, you know, everything above the, the neck. Uh, and that seems like it's a fairly narrow field, but it's actually a pretty broad subject and there's really a lot to it. And so when uh, Sandy asked me to speak, I, I, I thought about, you know, what, what can I tell you all? And, the, what I did was I started writing down some of the common questions that I get asked by patients all the time. And, the, and I go through this, the, the same questions frequently. And so I thought th this is what I would talk about. Um, it, it's obviously something most people are interested in if the question keeps coming up. So I'm just going to go through some of the questions that I get asked and try to answer them. And so the first uh, question I'm always asked is, how do you pronounce this word? You know. And so it's it's up on the on the wind door and and um, I, I don't know if y'all saw uh, that movie My Big Fat Greek Wedding. Um, uh, I, I happen to be married to a Greek American, and so that that is a very accurate movie. And uh, I actually live that life. And uh, so my father-in-law is always talking to me about how all of our words come from Greek, and that's where otolaryngology comes from. And so it's. Oto means ear, rhino is nose, and we've kind of dropped that in, the, in our main word. Laryngo is throat, and so it's just the study of the ear, nose, and throat. So we're ear, nose, and throat doctors, and I don't know why we don't have that as the main name, but no, nobody really knows what this means, but that's, that's what we're called. So what do we treat? Uh, um, ear, nose, and throat conditions, some, this is just some of the things that we see. We, we see people with hearing loss, ear infections. Uh, problems with uh, balance disorders, uh, sinus infections, obstruction, smell and taste disorders, uh, of course, uh, voice and swallowing problems, uh, airway problems, throat infections, uh, tonsillectomy is one of the more common things we do, and then uh, benign and uh, malignant tumors as well as uh, trauma. So uh, I'm just going to go through some of these and try to go through the, the, some of the main, more common things. And I'd like to start out with the ear. And uh, so when we talk about the ear, the ear can be broken into three different areas. There's the outer ear, there's the middle ear, and the inner ear. So when somebody says, I've got an ear infection, that can be a lot of things. And, um, you know, they all are treated a little differently. And the most common thing that I see, one of the more common things, is an outer ear infection. And so I'm, a lot of you all may have experienced that. It's, it's, a lot, it's very common uh, this summer when people are going to the lake. Uh, but it, and, and it's also known as swimmer's ear. But pe most people get it without swimming. So it's, that's, when I say swimmer's ear, is just an easy thing to say, but it doesn't mean you've been swimming. And the reason it happens is if you look at the anatomy of the ear, the outer ear is just a tissue paper thin skin on top of cartilage and then on bone. And there's no padding or anything. Um, if you look on the outside on our scalp, there's a little bit of fat, there's a little bit of muscle and then bone. So I can, you know, I can tap like this and that doesn't really hurt. But if I did that inside your ear, you'd jump and hit the ceiling. So it doesn't take a lot to cause trouble here. And what we see commonly is Maybe somebody's gone in with a Q-tip, which is one of the more common reasons, and pushed a little wax or a little skin down by the eardrum. Then water gets trapped in there from a shower, or bacteria grows in there, and then you start start getting, and then if you break, you can break the skin. It's just really, really easy, even with a Q-tip, to traumatize the ear canal. 
And so then what you end up with is this situation with a red, swollen, inflamed external ear canal. And this is probably one of the most painful things you can have. I, I've seen just really tough, grown men come in in tears with this. Uh, and, uh, it, it, you know, so it's, and it's treated differently than you would with a middle ear infection. So how do we treat this? Um, the main thing we want to do is get antibiotics and steroids down into this swollen ear canal. And the reason it's so painful is that if you get swelling on the outside of your skin somewhere, you know, it's got plenty of room to swell, but inside the ear, it doesn't have anywhere to swell. It has to go in and it reaches a point where there's no more room and then it just gets incredibly painful. And then you can't hear and, and it really it hurts to touch your ear. So what you have to do is we, we try to get antibiotic drops and we try to get steroids. And usually we can do this with drops. We usually avoid oral antibiotics. That's really not the way to treat this unless it's really gotten out of hand. And we also have to clean the ear because often there's skin and wax pushed down into the ear canal, which is what's really causing the problem. And if you don't get that stuff out of the ear, the, the drops aren't gonna work. So I see a lot of people that come in, they've been on drops, they're not getting any better. And then the main thing I do to treat them is to get that cleaned out. And I usually do it with a microscope and a suction and try to be as atraumatic as I can. Uh, I'm, I'm lucky because I have that equipment, but your primary care doctor might try to irrigate it out. You have to be real careful with that because irrigating the ear can sometimes cause this problem. So sometimes people come in with wax and that's, that's the problem. But if you don't get that stuff out, you're not gonna get better with the drops. And then the big thing is to avoid the trauma. And as I said, again, this is the biggest reason that I see for, for, for this problem. I, there's two things I see as people come in with a big wax buildup in their ear or, or an ear infection or both. And it's because of this Q-tip thing. And so, you know, we've been on this earth a long time without Q-tips. And uh, we did fine. And, and uh, so if you want to be able to go and visit the ear, nose, and throat doctor, then keep using the Q-tips. But the rule of thumb is nothing smaller than your elbow goes in your ear. So, uh, you know, you really don't need to do that. The re the, the, the wax is produced right here on the very outside of the ear canal. It's not produced down here. So when I see somebody in the office with a bunch of wax down by their eardrum, they've pushed it in somehow. And the wax has three purposes. It's, uh, it's an oil gland, so it, uh, it actually keeps the ear from getting dry and itchy. It repels water, um, so it helps keep water out when you take a shower or swim. And it actually has antibiotic properties. So it's really something that's supposed to be there. And, the skin in our ear canal migrates from the inside out, so it kind of carries itself out, um, and, and it really cleans itself. And so when you, when you wipe off the outer ear, you're really cleaning the inside of the ear. If you touch your outer ear, it's a little drier and flakier than the rest of your body, because all the skin from the inside is coming out onto there. The wax is natural. It's a protective barrier. It's supposed to be there, and people... Most people don't. If you leave it alone, it cleans itself. And now there are people that do have wax buildup that have to get it cleaned out. From there. For some people, it doesn't work, and, that, and that's the case. And if you have to, you can, you, you can irrigate the ear. The, the best thing is a little uh, vinegar and alcohol. That's what's in the swimmer's ear stuff over the counter. You can just uh, you could put a little bit of that in uh, at the end of a shower and let it run out. Uh, but you really don't want to stick things down in your ear because it, it's, it's kind of like the cannon and the gunpowder and a, you know, you're plunging it down and eventually some people get away with it but a lot of people it, it ends up obstructing the ear canal it's a it's it's a it's an oil it's a specialized oil gland and you've got it all over your body it's just a little thicker there if you think about it if you tried to really scrub the skin on your ear and just get it rid of all the oil as hard as you can every day pretty soon your skin gets dry and flaky and itchy and so if you're doing that with the Q-tip, then your ear's going to get dry and flaky and itchy all the time. And then you got to keep using the Q-tip because of that. feels good to scratch it, and the water gets in there. So if you, li if you leave it alone after a while, you know, it, it takes care of itself. In most cases, not always. And so middle ear infection, that's the, uh, that's the next step. So a middle ear infection is when you get fluid built up in the middle ear because the eustachian tube, which drains the ear, gets blocked. And so uh, middle ear infections are, are really different from an outer ear infection um, and drops really aren't going to help this. 
Um, and so there are two types of middle ear infections or otitis media. There's acute and serous. Uh, so acute uh, is, here's a picture of, of a normal ear. Here's an acute otitis media. It's bulging, it's white. Um, sometimes they'll rupture, again, incredibly painful. Uh, that, the, kind of the way to tell between this and a swimmer's ear, you, if you wiggle the ear uh, and, and it hurts, then you probably have a swimmer's ear. If it just hurts all the time, no matter whether you touch it or not, then it's probably the middle ear infection. You can also get fluid behind the ear, which is serous otitis media. This is a clear fluid with some air bubbles. And the natural progression from an acute infection is you go through this stage and then it clears up. Uh, but sometimes you get fluid that builds up. It's a mucoid middle ear uh, fluid that just never goes away. And then you have a hearing loss. And a lot of kids can develop this. Um, and it can affect their hearing, and they just think that's the way it's supposed to be. It can even affect their speech after a while. And so what causes an infection? Uh, middle ear infections, usually some sort of an insult causes it, uh, either a virus or a bacterial infection or allergies, cause it to get inflamed, and then it, it, the eustachian tube gets swollen. And, and most of the time it's going to clear itself on, on its own. Uh, sometimes you have large adenoids, which is right in the back of the nose where the ear drains, and so that can cause a problem. Gastric reflux can actually cause problems with the ears. There's, there's been um, in several studies that have looked at fluid in the middle ear in children that we put tubes in, and they found in 50 to 75 percent there's pepsin in the ear, which is only produced in the stomach. So the only way it got there was refluxing up, so sometimes you know, little kids are spitting up a lot, that's, that's causing irritation. Of course, smoking contributes to it, and so if there's a smoker in the house, you want them to be outside. Uh, you don't want the child to be exposed to secondhand smoke. I think most people are aware of that now. Um, but some people have an abnormal eustachian tube anatomy, or it's just a genetic predisposition. You know, if you look at, at kids that people say, why, why is my child having all these ear infections? And it kind of sorts out into thirds, about one third of all kids, uh, you know, maybe have an ear infection or don't, uh, and that's about it. And, and then about one third have two or three, but it goes away. And about one third have a lot of ear infections. It turns into this middle ear fluid, and they have to end up having something more aggressive done. Um, and the, the reason the smoking is so bad, I just want to put, I thought this was a great picture of the the, uh, the, here is the, the ciliated mucosa in the ear. It's also in the sinuses and in your lungs. And you have cilia across this mucous membrane. And then they're mucus glands. They produce mucus. And so the cilia are always beating, and they push the mucus out. And so, you know, if you go back and look, the cilia are inside here. They're pushing the mucus, and it flows down, and it gets out of the ear. But it, when there, there's a good studies that when cigarette smoke gets exposed to the mucosa, the cilia get paralyzed for two or three hours. They just stop moving. And then the mucus glands, in response to that, start secreting more mucus. So what you end up with is a lot more mucus that's stagnant, and so then bacteria can start growing and you get infections. That's, smokers tend to have more sinus infections and ear infections and lung infections. And children tend to have more trouble than adults. Because of the anatomy, if you look at the infant ear, the uh, eustachian tube is a lot smaller and adults a lot larger. So the most common time for ear infections is between six months of age and about two years of age. Usually by the time they get to be three or four, they, they've outgrown the problem and you don't see it as much. And we do see ear infections in adults and sometimes we, we have, you know, that can be a problem, but most of the time it's in young children. And so the treatment of otitis media, we, you know, the, the main thing, two things that will clear this up, if this is a diagram of fluid and a swollen eustachian tube, is antibiotics and steroids. Those are the two things that have been proven to help. Um, all the other things can help symptoms, but, but they don't really, the only two things that really help are antibiotics and steroids. And so, you know, we can put them on an oral antibiotic, we can give them an oral steroid or a steroid nose spray to take down the swelling. If they've got allergies, you want to control the allergies. If you have reflux, you want that controlled. Avoid secondhand smoke. Breastfeeding is a protective thing, so if, if uh, young mothers that can breastfeed, that's a good thing. When you get into group care with your kids, then they're getting exposed to more um, infections and viruses, and so they start having more trouble. But if none of these things are helping, then we have to resort sometimes to surgery, which is 
uh, tubes and sometimes an adenoidectomy. And so here's a picture of, uh, of PE tubes, which is a, one of the more common things we do. Uh, and, and here's the eardrum, and what we do is make an incision in the eardrum. Uh, now, of course, that would hurt, so it's under anesthesia for children. and adults, we can usually numb it up and get it done in the office if you have to. We suction out all the fluid, and we slip a little tube in there, and it just ventilates the ear, and uh, it's sort of a, like a bypass type thing. And so people always ask, well, how big are tubes? And th these are the tubes we use. That's a picture I took in my, my hand. And so they look big on the picture, but they're really, we use a microscope to put them in, very small, soft, silastic tubes. And once they're in, you don't know they're there, and they generally work their way out, and, and then nobody uh, ever even sees them, really. And people ask, how long do they last? Uh, so a tube would sit in the ear, eardrum. They usually last about a year, more or less. And the reason, again, that happens is because of the way the skin and the ear canal works. It's the skin, as it grows, it's just like the rest of our body. It's growing all the time. If there wasn't a way to get stuff out of the ear canal, then we'd all have a bunch of dead skin in our ear. So it flows like a glacier. And so as the skin grows here, it moves right out slowly till it gets out here, and then it flakes off. And as it grows, you know, this tube is being pulled and pulled. And one day you'll look, and it'll be sitting here. and. You know, one day it's maybe on the outer ear canal, and one day maybe you find it on the pillow, or you may never see it. And, uh, and it's a pretty amazing system. They've done studies where they put an ink dot on the eardrum and take a picture, and you can watch the ink dot walk right on out the ear over about six months. So inner ear problems, uh, that's a little different, and that's usually going to be hearing loss or dizziness or tinnitus. And so just a little quick word about how the ear works. You know, sound waves enter the ear canal. They vibrate on the eardrum. And then the middle ear bones transmit it to a nerve, which takes it to the brain so you can hear sound. And so when you have a hearing problem, you, you, it can be two things. It can be a conductive hearing loss or a sensorineural hearing loss. So in a conductive loss is um, some sort of blockage out here. So a big plug of wax, uh, maybe fluid in the ear, maybe some problems with the bones. A sense of neural loss is going to be a real nerve damage, and uh, so that's, that's uh, just a little different. And so when we measure hearing, when somebody comes in, we get an, an audiogram, and this is what an audiogram is going to look like. And so the way this is, is, is uh, the, over the side, these are decibels, and so it starts out at zero, and we go to the, the larger the number, the louder the sound. And so, and then these are frequencies, low frequencies to high frequencies. So we do pure tone audiograms. We put a tone in, in the ear, and you can see that a normal hearing is going, to, is going to look like this. And the further the line is down, the worse your hearing is. Most conversational speech is right here in the mid-range. And so the hearing loss that we see typically is this kind of thing with a high-pitched hearing loss. Uh, that's typically how we lose our hearing. It starts with the high pitch and progresses. Most people preserve low frequency hearing. And so the high pitch sounds, those are the consonants. That's the crisp understanding of sound. Low pitch is the power of sound. So people that have this kind of hearing loss, they come in and say, well, you know, I, I don't have a hearing problem. I can hear, I just can't understand. And so the problem, and, and, they, and everybody wants to know, well, how much hearing loss do I have? And it's, it's, it's really this. It it's, it's, depends on where it is in the frequencies. And it's normally in the high frequencies. You're just going to have trouble understanding. You'll have, you, you'll have trouble with high-pitched voices. Uh, when you're talking to children or, or, or female with a higher-pitched voice, it's going to be harder. Uh, when you're talking to men or when you're one-on-one -on -one with a deeper voice, then you don't have a lot of trouble. So... Uh, this is the typical type of loss you get. And just looking at sound intensity, if you look at it, normal hearing is in this range. Uh, so, you know, whisper, quiet room is going to be here. Speaking voice is here in about 40 decibel. When you start getting here into the, uh, you know, the 80s and 90s, we're talking jackhammers, trains. That starts to get a little uncomfortable. Gunshots, you know, are down at 120 and 140 jet engines. This is painful noise. And so you can see that, uh, you know, if your hearing is way down here, then you're, you know, you, you hear the word, I can't hear thunder, you know, you can't, you just can't hear anything. Uh, this is where most people are right in this area. 
And so the, the reason people get hearing loss when they come in, you know, it's either conductive or sensor neural. So if it's wax or it could be a hole in the eardrum, it could be middle ear fluid, it could be a problem with the middle ear bone. There's a otosclerosis, which is a stiffening of the bone. That, these things can all be fixed. Uh, if it's a sensor neural hearing loss, <clears throat> it's usually from noise exposure and then some genetics. Drugs can cause it. Uh, there are Meniere's disease, which is a condition that is a buildup of fluid in the inner ear that we could actually treat with, with a diuretic. If you have one ear that's going bad, especially slowly over time, you really want to get it checked because you could have an acoustic neuroma. It's unusual, but you don't want to miss that. That's a benign tumor that pushes down on the ear and uh, can make your hearing drop out. And so when we see somebody with hearing loss, you know, treatment would be remove the wax if that's the problem and that's kind of nice and you fixed it. Or if there's a hole in the eardrum or fluid or there's stiff bones, we can fix that. Um, we can give diuretics for Meniere's disease. Uh, but if you have a nerve loss, then amplification is the, the best thing to do, uh, shown here with a, with a hearing aid. And prevention is, is important too. So just the, the thing about prevention uh, you kind of think of noise as radiation exposure. So, you know, if you're in, in sunlight, for example, is radiation exposure. You can be out in the sun for a few minutes and it's not going to be a big problem. But if you're in the sun day in and day out, if you don't use protection, you're going to start getting, you know, burned skin. You're going to start getting freckles, maybe skin cancers. And so, and then there's some people who can be in the sun for just a minute, fair skinned people, and they burn quickly. Some people can be out there a lot longer and they don't, so, we're, so our genetics plays a role there a little bit. But there's, these are OSHA guidelines, and you, know, you, you can be exposed to eight hours at 85 dB, but when it gets really loud, you, you, know, you start having hearing loss after as little as just a few minutes. So the rule of thumb is you know, if it's too loud to have a conversation, then you really ought to use hearing protection. You want to protect it because it adds up over time. It's cumulative. And so these are things, common things, you know, we have a lot of hunters in Arkansas, people with industrial noise, you want to use hearing protection. And even just mundane things like mowing the yard or weed eaters and those, th those kind of things can be pretty loud over time. And so you really want to use protection there. You can't talk to anybody anyway, so you may as well protect your ear. And then, of course, the uh, uh, hearing uh, phones, that's something that is underappreciated uh, that people really crank those things up and you, and you can cause hearing loss pretty quickly with that. So just turning it down just a few notches is, is, can help protect you. And then the other question I get is do I need a hearing aid? So somebody comes in, they've got this hearing loss. Well, okay, I got a hearing loss, but do, do, you, do I need a hearing aid? And, and my answer is that you know, nobody needs a hearing aid. Um, it's a quality of life issue. So. If you're having trouble understanding and missing information, it can be pretty isolating. Uh, then a hearing aid really can help you, but it's your choice. Uh, you know, I kind of like my glasses. Uh, I, I don't need them, but life sure is better with them. And uh, same thing with hearing aids. And so uh, the other question I get is, well, okay, I, 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 I could use a hearing aid, but I'm going to wait till my hearing gets a lot worse before I get a hearing aid. Well, when, by the time you get down here and then you don't have any hearing really. It, it, when it gets really bad, hearing aids don't work as well. So the worse your hearing is, the worse the hearing aid is going to work. And you know, if you can't hear anything, it doesn't matter how loud you shout in their ear, it's just not going to help. So you're better off if you're having problems, uh, get it uh, when it can help you, if you think it's a problem. But, um, and this is me, they're, they're, they're not, uh, I'm wearing my aid here on my right ear. I don't know if I actually have it in right now. Um, but you, it's hard to see. They're pretty inconspicuous. Even though they look kind of big and clunky, they're really a lot more comfortable than they used to be. Um, the other is tinnitus. Um, ten, and and I, I, a lot of people probably have that in this room. And tinnitus is when you have the perception of noise uh, when it's not there. And, and tinnitus is because you've got a hearing loss. So when you hear a ringing sound, especially when it gets really quiet, uh, that's that's because of a little bit of a hearing loss that you have. And a lot of people hear it when it's when it's quiet. They're going to sleep at night. They turn the lights off. Everything's quiet, and then you hear this ringing sound. And I compare it to having your leg fall asleep. Everybody's had that happen where you, you sit in the wrong position. Your leg starts to tingle. 
because it's asleep. It feels like ants are crawling all over it. And that's what's happening here in the ear. Your ear is tingling because it's partially asleep. And, but the ear doesn't feel tingle. The ear perceives sound. So you hear a noise instead of feel a tingle. So it's not your imagination. It's really there. It's, like, it's a nerve loss. And so there's really not a pill or a surgery that helps it. Hearing aids help during the day by masking, by putting, amplifying the background sound. And then at night, you can just get a white noise that, that just masks it out. And my wife and I put a fan on when we sleep at night because it just it's a soothing white noise and it kind of masks it out. And a lot of people figure that out and they're already doing that. And, uh, but that's the way to treat it. And it's one of those things that if you think about it, it gets worse. If you, de you know, there's a lot of sounds around us that are not meaningful. And, it, you know, if you, if you let it get on your skin, it gets worse. But if you understand what it is, it's not a life-threatening problem. It's a nuisance. Uh, I, my, I, have, I have tinnitus, and when I talk to somebody about it, I start to hear it. And when otherwise, I don't, don't really notice it. And so I'll move on to the nose and just talk quickly about sinusitis. Um, so sinusitis is inflammation of the sinuses, and that doesn't mean necessarily that it's a bacterial infection. It just means it's inflamed. And so it can be from viruses, it can be from bacteria, even fungus. Uh, there's acute sinusitis, which is less than four weeks, and then there's chronic, which is three months, and recurrent, where you get three or four times a year. And so acute sinusitis and chronic sinusitis are pretty significant. Uh, they, they, they call it, there are many cases, you know, probably 15, 20% of the population gets this. And acute sinusitis, you miss work from this, you may miss a few days, or, or you just don't feel so good. Chronic sinusitis, uh, that just decreases the quality of your life. And they've done quality of life surveys for people with chronic sinusitis, and they, they've scored worse than people with things like heart failure and back pain. And you'd be surprised, but I, when people have chronic sinusitis and finally get it clear, it kind of changes your life. It, people don't realize how bad it makes you feel. So sinusitis, again, it can be allergy or virus that can cause this. Or, uh, so it's usually a virus or something. It causes inflammation. Smoking makes you a little more predisposed to it. It causes the cilia to get damaged. Like I mentioned, the mucus builds up and it gets trapped. And then you get this fluid that's there. Sometimes there can be anatomic blockage like a polyp or a deviated septum contributing to it. And the end result is this chronically infected nose. And so what are the symptoms of bacterial sinusitis? And I, I just want to emphasize the difference between bacterial and viral sinusitis because uh, really there's no difference in the symptoms, whether it's a, a cold or a bacterial infection. It really is, has to do with severity and duration. And the three main symptoms are going to be drainage, facial pain, and obstruction. And so drainage, you know, usually you'll look in the nose, you'll see discolored drainage, maybe down the back of your throat or out of the nose. But that can be from other things too. You can have post-nasal drip, for example, from reflux, or you can have a sore throat that, that masquerades as that. So just having drainage alone or allergy doesn't mean you have a sinus infection. Facial pain can be from a dental infection. You can have cheek pain from that. You can have migraines or muscle tension headaches. And so that alone is not necessarily a sinus infection. And I, I probably see, you know, two or three people a week that come in that are having migraines and they've been treated over and over and over with antibiotics. They get this pain, migraines can masquerade with that. They're not typical for, you know, the classic migraine. They cause your nose to get congested and run. And uh, they get on antibiotics, and then they get better. But that's maybe the course of the migraine. It's going to run its course. And so if somebody comes in, they've been on 5, 10 antibiotics a year, and they're not getting better. If you're not getting better with the treatment, maybe something else is going on. And then nasal obstruction can be anatomic issues and not just an infection. And so the virus versus the bacterial infection, um, there's really no difference in the symptoms in the first 5 or 10 days. So here's a, a nice a graph that shows symptoms with a, with a cold. So people, you may get a fever, you may get a headache, you get nasal obstruction, you get a cough and drainage. But over a period of five to 10 days, all this kind of tapers out and goes away. And if you, if it's been, you know, you got a fever and all this stuff and it's day, day two and you come in and get an antibiotic and it goes away, you go, well, look, the antibiotic helped me. 
but in fact, it's just going to run its course. So you really want to be careful about taking antibiotics um, if you don't have to. And so how do we diagnose it? It's mainly history and physical. So you have the, the symptoms that I mentioned, and then uh, take a look inside, see what's going on in the nose. In my office, you'll probably get a nasal endoscopy, which is, you know, just numb up the nose a little bit and take a look, and we can really see what's going on. Um, and if there's infection, you know, we can get a culture so that we can do culture-directed antibiotics. X-rays can be helpful, but, you know, you have to be careful with those, too. An, an X-ray doesn't distinguish between a virus and a bacterial infection. So if you come in with a cold and, and you know, all congested and, and I get an X-ray, it's going to look terrible. And you know, that really doesn't tell me anything that I don't already know. So really you want to be careful about getting too many x-rays, that's radiation exposure. We just use it when there's a question of the diagnosis. When, for example, my migraine patients that I'm talking about, you go, look, you know, something's not right here, so I'll get a CAT scan of the sinus and it's flat normal. They're having symptoms, it's obviously not an infection. So we can move away from being on all those antibiotics. And so we use it when there's a question of the diagnosis or when we're planning surgery and a CAT scan is much better than a plain x-ray. You know, these, this shows me there's some infection here, but this really shows me what's going on. There's, you know, blockage and thickening of the mucosa. And so, you know, there's a role for, for these plain x-rays to some degree, but uh, I, I usually just use CT scans because it gives me so much more information. And so how do we treat the sinuses? Um, there's a lot of uh, symptomatic uh, care out there. Uh, a few years ago, the neti pot got on the Oprah Winfrey show. I don't know if any of y'all saw that. And so it got popularized. Before that, everybody thought you were crazy to use those things. But I think these are great, these sinus rinse system. They're good to treat the cold because they wash out all the pathogens. They get rid of allergy, you know, dusts and molds. And so it's a great way to treat things without being on an antibiotic. And I, all my sinus patients, uh, we get started on this, uh, if, even if we're treating them with antibiotics and surgery. Uh, sometimes nasal steroid sprays help, oral steroids may be necessary. Antihistamines and decongestants help your symptoms. Uh, you know, if you've got an allergy, antihistamines are good to help control it. But antihistamines can dry you out, so you, that, you know, it dries the mucus up, but then that can maybe sometimes convert an allergy into a sinus infection, so you want to be careful. Mucus centers like Wafenicin are helpful, but if none of these help, then antibiotics and sometimes surgery. So I want to, again, emphasize the antibiotics. I think most people are sophisticated about this now, but, you know, it's, uh, in, in the past it's been that, you, you know, you come in, you got a cold, and, the, and you want an antibiotic. And, you know, that's easy to do. It's real easy to write a prescription, but that's not always the best thing to do because antibiotics can cost money, and they do have risk. I mean, they kind of scare me because I've seen all the reactions that can happen and you know you can have an allergic reaction you can get overgrowth of the wrong bacteria in your GI tract and you can develop bacterial resistance and that's happening now we, we just have um, a lot of resistant bacteria and, and if we run out of antibiotics that can use for it then we just don't have any way to treat them so you really want to save your antibiotics for when you need them and uh, use them appropriately and then ultimately it may come to surgery if, if it's a chronic or recurrent chronic problem. And so this is a diagram. It's endoscopic surgery that we do. And so, you know, there's no cutting or anything on the outside. You don't turn black and blue. And so here's an example of a CT scan. This patient has a, a normal left sinus. You can see how it drains through this narrow opening. On the right, you're obstructed and there's a little fluid. And they've got this concha bullosa, which is an anatomic variation that can cause some narrowing. And so with the, with the scopes, we would come in and just take down these little bony partitions so that you end up with a nice big open cavity and not, you're not obstructed. And so then that kind of helps keep, keep it clear. And so finally, we'll move on to the throat. Um, hope I'm not going too fast or too slow. Um, I wanted to talk about silent reflux because this is something I see a lot of, and it's a misunderstood uh, condition. Um, and, and it's, uh, you know, it's, it's called LPR or laryngopharyngeal reflux. And so um, if you look at gastric or reflux, uh, everybody has reflux. It's virtually 100% of humans' reflux. You get, it's, it's not a watertight seal between the esophagus and the stomach. And so that doesn't mean it's a problem. But, 
about 40% of the population has symptoms from this. And it's, it's been a big problem that's getting worse over the last few decades. I mean, you may, you know, you see all the purple pill commercials and everything, and, and it's really, the incidence has really been increasing. Uh, about 20% of people have GERD, which is heartburn, but about, 20, about 18% maybe have silent reflux. And so that's, that's, uh, that's not heartburn. And so the important message here is that the symptoms are caused by digestive enzymes, the pepsin, that's what I was talking about that they have found in, in ears. Uh, it's not the acid that causes it. And so the acid activates the digestive enzymes. It does not um, cause the, the main problem. And so most reflux medicines that you see, they don't stop reflux. And that's so people don't understand that. They think, well, I'm on Prilosec, so it stopped my reflux. But what it did was it reduced the acid that your stomach's producing, and you're still refluxing. And some of these enzymes can actually cause problems even when the acid is reduced. And so how does it affect the throat? You know, the, the heartburn is pretty straightforward. Everybody understands that. But this is not a watertight valve. You can get 10 or 20 episodes of reflux into the esophagus, and that's normal. If you see a gastroenterologist and they test for that, they'll say, well, you had 20 episodes in 20 hours, and that's normal. And the, the esophagus can take that because there is a carbonic anhydrase, which is in the mucosa, and so it neutralizes the acid naturally. The problem it gets to be when you're having prolonged episodes of reflux or more frequent, you use up that carbonic anhydrase and then you start getting heartburn and indigestion. For some people, the reflux actually gets all the way into the throat. It can be just a little vapor uh, or even quite a bit, but it can happen at night when you're sleeping. You may not even realize it. And what happens is you, get, you start breathing it into your lungs, you get into the nose, and what I see when I take a look like this in the office is a red, swollen, inflamed vocal cord. Uh, but people can get asthma symptoms. They can get you know, post-nasal drip and sinus symptoms. And so uh, just a little bit in the throat, the throat is not designed to withstand it like, like the esophagus can. So it doesn't take much to cause problem here. So you can have a lot of trouble in your throat from this and not have reflux, I mean, not have heartburn. And here are some of the symptoms. There's a handout that I gave that has this on it. Uh, but things like a lump in the throat, post-nasal drip, hoarseness, mucus in the throat, chronic cough, swallowing, sinus symptoms, people start developing asthma, and then heartburn. But most people, or a lot of people that have this, don't have heartburn. So, um, you know, the, the morning voice, you may have seen somebody, if you've been out late and ate a big meal and then went right to bed and you wake up and you have to cough and clear your throat and raspy, then you've probably had an episode of LPR happen. And some people have that happen all the time and it's, and it's pretty severe. And so we treat this with an anti-reflux diet uh, along with weight loss. And, so, and, and then proton pump inhibitors are, have really helped a lot. But again, those are things like Prilosec and Nexium. And what I see a lot is people get put on, they go, here, take this pill and you're, you're fixed. And so it's, the important thing is you really have to look at the diet. If you take that pill and then you go out and you drink and eat a lot of acidic food, which is all around us, then you're pouring acid down your throat and then you're not getting your money's worth from the pill you're taking. And those are expensive pills. And, and, you, and you don't get better sometimes. And so it may be, it's easy to control the heartburn, but it's really hard to control this. And we'll put people on twice a day reflux medicine and still not get it controlled. Sodium alginate is a, I don't know why it's not sold more over, the, it used to be sold over the counter, but it's, it's a, um, um, a food thickener. It's been around for 100 years. You, uh, it's, um, it, what it does is it mixes with uh, the uh, gastric acid and it forms a little mucus plug that literally plugs up the lower esophagus and prevents reflux. And you can get this uh, in England. You can order it online. There's a friend of mine who's a pharmacist who compounds it for me, and I sometimes give that out to people. And so if you're going to go out and have a late meal and you take that after you eat, and it goes away after a few hours. But if you do all these things and you keep having trouble, then you want to see your gastroenterologist uh, because you want to have it documented that that's really what's going on. 
Uh, and the way to do it is with a pharyngeal pH probe. A lot of gastroenterologists do esophageal pH probes. And so, like I said, you can get this probe down here and you can, they'll say, well, you know, you're normal. And, but they didn't look here, so you really can't say you're normal until you've done the probe in the pharynx. And, you know, not all gastroenterologists do that. But you also want to have the esophagus looked at because if you're having LPR, then you might be having Barrett's esophagus or even esophageal cancer. And there's this epidemic of esophageal cancer. That's, I mean, you may have been hearing about people getting esophageal cancer out of the blue. And, you know, that's just really was uncommon a long time ago. And, then, and every year it's getting more and more common. And we think it has to do with the diet. The, 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 there's a one theory that the, our food... There, it's a little controversial, but back in the 70s, there was some uh, episodes of botulism toxin, and so the FDA decided to acidify all foods to preserve it. And that's about when we started seeing a rise in Barrett's esophagus and esophageal cancer and started seeing more and more people with reflux, and, and, and maybe this, the reflux was always there, but the acid is really uh, pushing it. So the, the diet thing is real important, and, and a lot of people don't, don't get that. And sometimes surgery, you can have a little fund application to tighten that up. Um, so, again, I just want to emphasize the diet. I, I just I can't tell you how many people I see that come in and they, well, I'm on this medicine, I'm doing, and, and it's still not working, but, you know, you look and there's a Coke right next to them, and they, this is the same pH as your stomach contents. And, they're, you know, so drinking water really is the best thing, and, uh, you know, you, if you're pouring this stuff down your throat, then, you know, some people get away with it, but it can really set things off. And then a lot of the processed foods have that, too. So I'll just summarize here that, you know, I, I've, I've looked at some small things in the ear, nose, and throat, and, and I just want to emphasize that it's all connected. You know, the ear is connected to the throat, connected, you know, to the nose. And so a lot of things overlap, uh, and it's, you know, it's a pretty... Uh, uh, pretty pretty broad topic, really pretty interesting. And so some of the tips, you know, that you've heard me say through this that you, to keep you out of my office uh, is, you know, quit smoking if you smoke and, and avoid secondhand smoke. Protect the ears, avoid putting in things in the ear and use hearing protection. Try to maintain a, a healthy weight and avoid processed foods. That's, that's um, hard to do in our society. Uh, exercise and preventive care, you know, seeing your doctor to have, uh, have things checked beforehand because, you know, as our medical society, we are real good at treating crises. We're really good at treating the heart attack, but we're uh, not so good at preventing the heart attack from ever happening. And I think if we emphasize that more, then, you know, things would be a lot better. So I just want to end with this quote. Um, this is a friend of mine who sends this uh, at the end of his email every time. But, you know, there are only two ways to live your life. One is if nothing is a miracle. The other is if everything is. And, I, you know, I, every time I look at the human body at a small level or a large level, that's just, it just blows me away at what a miracle it is and, you know, how, how it all works. And, and it's, it's just it's really amazing. So I'm, I really feel fortunate to be able to do what I do. I really enjoy it. And, Anyway, I really appreciate the opportunity to be able to speak with you and be glad to answer any questions, if you have any. Yes, sir. Well, so sinus surgery uh, gets rid of the anatomic blockage, but it doesn't eliminate any medical cause for that. So, you know, usually there's something that's setting that off. So I, I would assume that, you know, you've looked into allergies and then, uh, you know, this, uh, you know, I don't want to say that everything's caused by reflux, but reflux can contribute some to that. And then you need a lot of uh, close uh, follow-up. There's, there's, um, it uh, depends on sometimes what the pathology is. There, there's, uh, if it was a fungal infection, there's a tendency for that to recur. And um, you need a lot of, you know, just taking out the, the blockage doesn't usually solve the problem. There's a thing called biofilms. Um, don't know if you all have ever heard of that, but it's, it's pretty interesting. Um, biofilms are, are is, is, is the way for bacteria to survive 
through really hostile environments like under a rock for years and years and years and come back. So bacteria have tend to go into this dormant state. And the, so you'll get this mucus with a and then the bacteria kind of are they, they don't real, they're not really producing much but they release what's called planktonic bacteria which are active ones but it's mainly just sort of dormant and you have to clean that stuff out which means you know you need to come back in and take a look and see what's going on in there with the scope make sure that's not there sinus irrigations and once you've had that happen it tends to recur biofilms are what happen when you get like an infected pacemaker and you have to pull a pacemaker out because you got a biofilm on it and once that happens, if you can't get rid of the biofilm, then it keeps recurring. And that, that's, I think that's a big problem uh, with all infections. But uh, you need to sit down and start looking at other things besides anatomy. And you know, sometimes you get scar tissue. You do have to do some revision. I don't know if that answers it. but Yes, sir? Um, so... Yeah, um, so sleep apnea is um, a difficult problem, um, and it's a lot of people have that. Um, there are four things that we look at for people that have sleep apnea. We look at areas of obstruction. I look at the nose. Is there a, something that going on there? Is there a big tonsil or palate? Is the tongue base enlarged? And is the, is your weight at the ideal level? And so. All four of those come together to cause the problem. Some of it's an anatomy structure. And so um, everybody wants to come in and just, you know, can you just sort of snip this and make it go away? And the reality is that surgery for sleep apnea has about a 50 to 60% cure rate. And so that's not the first thing you want to do. That really ought to be the last thing you want to do. Now, if somebody comes in, with a huge, you know, they don't have any airway at all in their nose from a polyps or a deviated septum, or they've got, you know, enormous tonsils. With kids, one of the big reasons that we take out their tonsils is because of sleep apnea. And it works pretty well for kids. It's got about a 90, 95% success rate. But in adults, it's not so, not so good. And, you know, what happens with sleep apnea is that when you go to sleep and you go into that deep REM sleep, which is when you, it's a restorative sleep, when you recharge your batteries, uh, you lose your muscle tone. And so you can lift your arm up and it flops down. And then, so normally your muscle tone is pulling your airway open, but when you go into REM and then it starts to vibrate and you start to snore or it collapses. And so, you know, the mainstay is uh, CPAP, which is positive pressure ventilation. And if that works for you, that's a great way to go because it's not surgery. But that's got about a 50% success rate because a lot of people can't tolerate it. So sometimes we do surgery, remove tonsils, shorten the palate, which is probably one of the most painful surgeries you can have. And that can help. Maybe it mo most people, it moves you to a, a better spot. And sometimes it does cure the problem. But if you're going to have any kind of surgery for that, then you really want to understand that it may not solve the problem as long as you understand that. It usually makes people get to a better place. It doesn't always cure it. And yes? Yeah, the, so the, tu the tubes don't uh, affect the hearing at all. They've, they've done uh, studies on that most of the time. It improves their hearing because the child has fluid behind the ear and they've they're already got a hearing loss or they're getting infections so often that when they're infected they have a hearing loss. So you don't just put a tube in on somebody with a normal ear. but So most of the time they are better, they, they hear better, and the, the tube itself is so small and so lightweight that it does not interfere with the conductive mechanism. And, um, you know, sometimes we've seen some hearing loss on kids that need two and three and four sets of tubes, and we think that's because they've had so many infections that it's damaging the middle ear. But um, it can affect their speech, you know, the fluid. We see a lot of kids come in with speech delay, got fluid behind their ear, and you put a tube in, and their speech immediately starts getting better. Any other questions? Thank you all very much.